fine. Sorry. Good. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, good whatever. Uh, Janine's about to do this one, I can tell you, because I've seen the start of her lecture. And we have a chicken. Thank you very much, Nisa. Welcome, professionally, as professional as we get, to the reopening of our Elephant Professional Lecture series. Um, we took a month off for Run, Walk, Crawl for Rangers, and now we are back with a biggie, um, with Dr. Janine Brown talking about her 20 year career looking after or I say chemically analyzing elephants. I know it's a rude way to put it, but that's possibly what that's how I describe what you do, Janine, uh, in my own brain anyway. And endocrinology, I think, is the is the proper term for it. Um, and Janine is somebody who I've sat in conferences with and worked on terms. And she's the person who helps or she and her students and her her followers and her disciples are the people who tell us how uh, help us put a finger on what actually really does affect elephant welfare quite so much of what we do in trying to manage elephants in captivity better around the world is based on our own assumptions as humans and uh, anthropomorphism and what offends us um, and really the best way to tell how an elephant whether an elephant is comfortable or not um, happy being a human concept um, is is to uh, to to get involved in in the chemicals that <laughs> that it produces internally um, and Janine has found many 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 ways to do this so uh, she has recorded the uh, recorded the video I don't know if you want to say a few words while I set up the video Janine um, just to say hello she's recorded her talk and then um, and then we'll do questions and answers afterwards so Janine over yeah. to you while I set up the video very good. Yes, um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, yeah, I have some kind of com computer glitches, so I was able to pre-record my, my talk. So hopefully it doesn't sound too monotone <laughs> since it's just a recording. But I did change the title, so I'll explain to you why I did that. But um, yeah, I'm just happy to be here. Um, would prefer to be in Thailand, but all is well. Yep, we would prefer to have you as well, Janine. Okay, so I'm going to play the video. Um, if you can't hear any sound, which is what happened last time, please do do speak quickly. We have tested it, so hopefully that won't happen again. But if you don't if you don't hear any sound, please shout quickly, and I'll do something to change it. So here we go. Without further ado, a recording of Janine. Poor old Janine has to listen <laughs> to her own voice. Something I know she dislikes for her for the next hour or so. Hi everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. I think it stopped making sound. Could you not hear it? I heard it for about five seconds and then it stopped. Nisa? also quiet on my end. Yeah. Let me try again. I'll just press play again. I could hear it. I was uh, just supposed to talk about my 20 year journey with elephants in Asia, which I promised yeah. to do. But as I was putting this talk together, it was clear that I couldn't really tease apart. Mm. No, nope, then it blanks out. You see, as I go through this, um, that those two sets of activities are in linked okay what happens is when i mute my microphone um you can't hear um that makes sense okay so i'm just going to continue to play and be very quiet um <laughs> sorry everybody i love the chicken though i love the chicken oh, sorry. Yes, and Lisa, you, luckily i'm not with me it. i love the chicken otherwise we'd have chickens the whole way through okay sorry you about better start at, at the beginning because i'm trying to explain how i changed my title <laughs> Okay, so I will start again from the beginning. Apologies to everybody watching. As you know, Janine, Nisa, and I, as you can notice, Janine, Nisa, and I know each other very well. So when we we are, she is an elephant professional. We are elephant professionals, but we are not necessarily professional presenters. We will start again, <laughs> and uh, off we go. People entering later. Hi everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's late in the evening for me, so almost uh, close to my bedtime. Uh, but I want to thank John for giving me the opportunity to talk about our work with elephants. As many of you know, nothing makes me happier than talking about elephants, and I could literally talk about them all day. 
With that said, I know I was uh, just supposed to talk about my 20 year journey with elephants in Asia, which I promised to do. But as I was putting this talk together, it was clear that I couldn't really tease apart very easily the work in Asia from what we had been doing earlier in the United States. And so I hope you see as I go through this, um, that those two sets of activities are inextricably linked. So for the past 35 years, my goal has always been to study the basic biology of elephants, which we knew very little bit about uh, back in the 80s. So we could use that information to improve reproduction and optimize health and welfare. But my work with elephants hasn't been entirely linear because I essentially have had two parallel careers, one in the US and the other in Thailand, generally offset by anywhere from two to 10 years. And lately, more often than not, the studies I do in the United States are now geared towards trying to determine, well, what can I learn or what new techniques can we develop that would be beneficial and useful and could be transferred to Thailand? But before I get started, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my background because my career path wasn't exactly linear either. I didn't start out to be a wildlife bi biologist or an elephant expert but rather I was an animal science major focusing on reproduction in domestic livestock species, dairy cattle in particular. So for my masters, I looked at nutritional factors affecting semen quality in dairy bulls. Then I worked in a nutrition lab for about a year. And then finally I was talked into getting a PhD and joined an endocrinology lab there to work on cystic ovarian disease in dairy cattle, where I learned a variety of endocrine techniques and became essentially hooked on hormones. When I graduated, I moved out east to work as a postdoc and then was later promoted to assistant professor at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, the government military medical school. There I looked at a variety of hormonal mechanisms associated re with reproduction, like those shown in the figures here, in both males and females, animal model species. And can I just say the goats were by far my favorites. They were so much fun to work with. But then, as luck would have it, the National Zoo was only a few miles down the road. And so long story short, they learned I was an endocrinologist and that I did have an interest in wildlife. And so I had the great fortune to work with three of the best wildlife researchers in the world. They were called the Three Amigos. Mitch Bush was a wildlife vet. Dave Wilt was a reproductive physiologist, both at the zoo. And Steve O'Brien was a geneticist at the National Cancer Institute, not too far away from the zoo. So we worked on a variety of studies together, looking at pituitary gonadal function in various cat species to start with, because that was kind of that cats were kind of their, their favorite, um, which then used my comparative experience in developing assays for a variety of domestic species. But then once I got a chance, but then I got a chance to travel overseas and I got a passport for the first time to do some field studies in Kruger National Park. Um, because the team had only worked with blood samples, we uh, designed studies to anesthetize Cape Buffalo and Impala, and we bled them every five minutes for two to four hours to assess pituitary testicular function in conjunction with assessing semen quality over two consecutive years during both the breeding and non-breeding season. And let me just say, this was so amazing. And I knew straight away that I would probably never be able to go back to just working with domestic animals again. But what really did it was a study we did on bull elephants where we anesthetized them and then treated them with various GnRH analogs to see if we could suppress testosterone as a means of controlling must. That was the precursor to later studies of GnRH vaccines, which we now know are quite effective in suppressing must symptoms in elephants. But then when I got home, the final epiphany came when I was asked by the elephant manager of the National Zoo if I could measure hormones in females and determine if one of their females was cycling. So Shanti was 12 years old and we really didn't know when elephants reached puberty. So of course I said yes, and then began figuring out how to measure progesterone in uh, serum to assess ovarian cycles. Uh, it turns out the concentrations are actually quite low in elephants, so it took a while to find a sensitive enough assay. We then monitored her for a year and a half uh, with twice weekly blood samples, and she was, in fact, cycling. So uh, looking at these um, 
dark circles, uh, you can see how nicely she was cycling. So she was then sent up to New York for breeding, and we then decided to monitor, monitor her pregnancy as well. And so we published that. And then I wanted to know how long it was going to take her to start cycling again after she gave birth so she could be bred again. And honestly, by that time, I was hooked and I decided we needed to monitor all of the elephants and to hopefully uh, never stop. So just as an example, this is Shanti monitored for over 20 years um, with first her natural pregnancy. And then later on, we, done, we did one by artificial insemination. Um, you might wonder what the cartoon of an elephant uh, on a bicycle is for. Well, you can thank John Roberts for that because he mentioned something on Facebook a while back that every time he heard me talking about elephants cycling, he thought of them riding a bicycle. So now, every time I say it, I think of that too. So, yeah, thanks, John. You're welcome. Anyway, all of that hard work paid off, and in 1991, I was hired as an endocrinologist at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, which is the research unit of the National Zoo, uh, and I was asked to develop an endocrine research program. So I worked a lot with felids at the beginning um, because that's what my mentor wanted me to do, but also elephants, which by that time I was now hooked on. So because we had started working with a lot of other zoos in the United States that also wanted to monitor their own elephants, uh, it resulted in us establishing the first wildlife endocrine lab uh, in the diagnostic lab in the country. And over the years, um, that hard work has paid off with significant increases in reproductive rates over the decades because zoos are now better able to track cycles and uh, better time breeding. So we published a lot of the, those data early on, and then we started getting requests from students and visiting scientists from other universities and conservation organizations who wanted to learn our techniques. Um, and by this time, we were doing more than just blood hormone monitoring. We had developed techniques to measure hormones in feces, urine, saliva, hair, and feathers. And no one else was really training the, these techniques for the next generation back then. So we started to offer training and internship opportunities. So this um, gal in the top uh, left-hand side with the red hair, that's actually my daughter doing an internship. And down below, you'll note Dr. M working with uh, Katie Edwards way back when. So we partnered with other universities and conservation organizations. And with all of this combined, um, today we have endocrine data on more than 150 species. So we are a truly comparative lab. So, um, but now to show you a bit of what we learned in the early days, and it was really exciting for a young scientist like me back then, because near, nearly everything we learned was new. And so here's just a short elephant biology overview. So they cycle between 14 and 16 weeks. So this is the longest of any mammal, and it means that they're only fertile for three to four times a year. They have a nearly two year uh, gestation. And then it takes them on average about a year before they start cycling again and could potentially get pregnant. Overall, elephants have a four to six year interbirth interval, so they're not really reproducing all that much throughout their lifetime. One of the interesting things that we found was that elephants in captivity seem to reach puberty um, at a younger age, between four and eight years, compared to maybe eight to 12 years uh, in the wild. But one of the things that we started to see in our service lab was that there were a lot of elephants um, that were not cycling. We call them flatliners because if they, and if they don't cycle, they can't conceive. So about 20% of the Asians don't cycle normally, but those are mostly the older post-reproductive females. So we weren't too terribly worried about them, but for Africans, flatlining occurred in all age groups. So that was a major threat to population sustainability. And it was really something that we weren't expecting to see. So in the mid nineties or so, I sort of went down a rabbit hole for 15 years trying to figure out what was wrong, relying on my animal sciences background to kind of throw the kitchen sink at the problem to try to figure out if there were issues with the hypothalamus, pituitary, gonads, or, or some other endocrine mechanism. And in the end, we really didn't find any clear physiological reason for the high rates of acyclicity. 
other than some hormones um, just didn't have normal patterns. Um, but what caused that uh, was something we, we just didn't know. So that's when we finally started thinking that it might be bigger than just endocrinology and that we might need to take a more holistic approach to see if acyclicity or some kind of reproductive suppression might be related to management or linked to uh, welfare factors. And that led us to our next rabbit hole, uh, trying to determine if there were links between reproduction and management with the idea being that if we could identify management conditions that support good welfare, maybe that would have a positive effect on ovarian function and reproduction. But how do you measure welfare? So that's kind of the $64,000 question. Um, it's not easy and there's no one single test that we can do to determine if an animal is happy or not or has good welfare or not. Rather, we need to look at welfare in a more holistic and to take into account how well we are meeting the physical or physiological needs of the animal through just providing good care, uh, but also, especially for intelligent social animals like elephants, we need to know if we're meeting their psychological needs as well, which is needed for good welfare. So how do we do that? Well, one way is to conduct multi-institutional, multidisciplinary epidemiological type studies. And so back in 2010, a group of us got a million dollar grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services to study how factors in the captive environment, these are input variables that are shown in circles, uh, affected welfare outcomes shown in the squares of nearly every elephant in our accredited zoos in North America. So this was the largest welfare study of its kind at the time. And my lab was responsible for all of the endocrine analyses. So we ended up with over 6,000 blood and 6,000 fecal samples that were each evaluated for up to 12 hormones. Luckily, I hired the best technician ever, Steve Paris, who some of you know, and thankfully he is still with me. We didn't break him. Uh, so anyway, we took all the data and did some complicated statistical modeling that I don't understand to see what uh, impact factors uh, impacted welfare outcomes. So this study ended up with at least 19 publications, but I'll spare you and only report the work that we did um, looking at reproduction. So not surprising, for a social species, there were a number of social factors that were um, associated with whether a female would cycle normally or not. And that included being in a mixed sex herd. So having males and females together, that seems fairly intuitive, uh, but also having high social experiences. So females that were sort of integrated into larger herds where she was interacting with a lot of other elephants had a positive uh, effect on her reproductive function. Experiencing a pregnancy uh, was also related to whether a female would cycle normally or not. And we sort of call this like a use it or lose it uh, because we know that if, um, you know, to, to breed animals on a regular basis is, is a really good thing to do. And if you wait too long in between pregnancies, then you have a reduced chance that that female is eventually going to get pregnant again. So you know, our goal is to try to get reproductive animals breeding at a fairly regular basis. But we also saw that socialized isolation decreased the chance that a female would cycle normally. And in some cases, when there's a social incompatibility, um, females are sometimes kept separate. And even when they were allowed to interact through howdy gates and whatnot, those socially isolated females had a, a lesser chance of being a normal cycling female. So we basically concluded that multi-generational herd structures with calves and bulls and elephants spending more time in socially compatible groups is much better for reproduction and welfare. Uh, we also looked at a number of management factors and in particular enrichment diversity was associated with um, more ovarian cyclicity. So this was offering enrichment items, uh, many enrichment items multiple times a day, not doing the same one, you know, every day, um, kind of mixing it up. Uh, and then the other thing was feeding diversity. So not throwing a bunch of hay in front of an elephant, but uh, 
feeding it in different ways, hiding it, different kinds of food, you know, kind of making the elephants work to find their food and eat their food uh, was good for ovarian cyclicity. So we concluded that promoting normal behaviors may enhance physiological function. And then even before the IMLS study, my student Carrie Moorfeld and I had been worried about the high rates of obesity in zoo elephants and possible links to poor reproduction, which was based on studies in other species. Uh, so for the IMLS study, we focused on that quite a bit. And over three quarters of the elephants in that study were either overweight or obese. And at least in African elephants, that appeared to be associated with problems with ovarian cyclicity. So then we also developed <clears throat> methods to look at metabolic function associated with obesity, including things like glucose and looking at the glucose to insulin ratio, which in women, lower values are associated with a higher degree of insulin resistance or diabetes risk. We don't really think elephants get diabetes per se, but this is definitely associated with obesity. Lower, lower G to I ratios are associated with obesity. We looked at leptin, which is a hormone produced by fat cells, and not surprisingly, higher values are associated with obesity. But interestingly, high leptin was also associated with ovarian acyclicity. And then um, our modeling showed that increasing the feeding diversity and exercise, again, making elephants look for their food, resulted in normal body condition and better metabolic function. Uh, we looked at fecal glucocorticoids and we found that being um, time alone, remember that was also associated with ovarian acyclicity. Uh, poor joint health, which was also associated with the time on hard surfaces, was also associated with higher, quote unquote, stress levels, uh, low enrichment diversity also, whereas positive keeper contact uh, was associated with low glucocorticoids, as was elephants getting a lot of exercise. Now, the interesting thing is, and this is where we can't say that high glucocorticoids means bad stress and low glucocorticoids means good welfare. Um, here's a case where the presence of calves was associated with increased glucocorticoids. So it's simply a, an indicator of stimulation. And I imagine anybody out there uh, who have had kids knows that they can be very stimulating and potentially increases your, your cortisol levels, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But overall, what we found was that it wasn't so much the total amount of space that was important, but how enriched the space was, and that it's more important to have a complex environment with socialized elephants. And our hypothesis was correct in that many of the factors important for good welfare in general were also important for normal reproductive function. So that finally brings us to Asia where I hope you will see as we go along that the challenges facing captive zoo elephants are all, not all that different from those faced by tourist elephants. So now we need to flash back 20 years when I first went to Thailand in 2001 and then again in 2002, where we were conducting studies on bull uh, elephant semen freezing at Mesa Elephant Camp. With, uh, I was there with the Berlin boys uh, Thomas uh, Hildebrandt and Frank Gortz, who I think a lot of you know. And it was then that I started to learn more about some of the issues faced by captive elephant populations in, in Asia and how similar they seem to be to the challenges we were facing in the U.S. So um, I was a little surprised to find out that a third of all Asian elephants um, are managed by humans. They are kept under human care in captivity and used in a variety of ways, kind of depending upon the country. But that most of these populations, at least back in the, you know, 20 years ago when I was there, they were not self-sustaining populations. Um, you know, maybe Pinoella in Sri Lanka, um, you know, had, had decent breeding, but most of, the, most of the tourist camps in Thailand actually were not doing very well. 
So um, in the second trip that I took, so that would, would have been 2002, I met with Chacho Thitaram for the first time and his dean, Dr. Suvachai, and they approached me and said they were interested in establishing an endocrinology lab at Chiang Mai and that they were very interested in doing some uh, female reproduction studies. So we did a training workshop in 2003, and we just kind of continued to work together after that, conducting similar studies of elephant biology. And again, we sort of started out focusing on reproduction, but as the years went on, we got more and more into, you know, more holistic studies looking at, at welfare as well. And so there's little doubt that Thailand is the epicenter of elephant tourism. Uh, and the animals are used in a variety of ways. And the question then is, how do these activities uh, actually affect their wealth? And so there are a number of groups that would say that all these activities are bad for elephant welfare. And so tourism has come under increased scrutiny with reports in the media about how tourists should avoid camps that allow riding or shows without having any scientific evidence to support it. You know, it's kind of cancel culture without any real evidence. So uh, we decided to study and more study it in more detail to determine, you know, what activities are actually good or potentially harmful to, to elephants. And so we conducted our own epidemiological study in Thailand, which was coordinated by Dr. Bick and our former uh, PhD student, Jadawang, and included training of two new PhD students. So Pakanut, I think a lot of you know Dr. M, and Tree Pradab, uh, Dr. Best, you know, did a lot of the nutritional work. So it was um, fun sort of co-advising all these people. And so this study involved 33 camps in three provinces in northern Thailand with more than 600 elephants. There were direct camp observations and written questionnaires to gather information on camp management, the kinds of tourist activities, the workloads the elephants had, how they were housed, their health care, and the use of various tools to control them. And then we collected welfare measures that were very similar to what we had done in the United States. So body condition scores, we did health assessments, looking at wound and foot scores. We measured metabolic markers, uh, lipid panels, and then collected fecal samples for glucocorticoid analyses as a proxy for stress. And then those were all uh, modeled. And the goal was to use a similar epidemiological approach to what we did in the US and model the welfare measures, uh, which are now shown in yellow and blue against the camp survey input data, which are shown in pink. And so the kinds of activities that we saw across these 33 camps, all of them allowed tourists to feed elephants. Most of them allowed tourists to bathe elephants. Uh, a number of them were involved in riding either with or without a saddle. Walking with elephants was popular. Um, some just let you observe a bath. Uh, not so many were still um, doing shows and we only had one camp that was a kind of a hands-off free move uh, camp. But what we found when we modeled this against uh, some of our welfare indicators was that we found that, that, that feeding bananas and sugarcane had some, had some problems uh, and that it was associated with high body condition scores. So about 60% of our elephants were scored as either overweight or obese. And that was associated with poor metabolic uh, function and health. And so for an example, we also looked at the data in terms of high and low tourist seasons, and you can see higher insulin during the high season, which is likely related to more tourists feeding sweet treats, um, which is probably not good. Uh, the elephants worked on average about six and a half hours per day, mostly giving rides. And where while there might be criticisms about riding, if it's done right, we found that it could actually be good for physical and physiological health in that riding elephants uh, had better body condition and metabolic health. However, if camps don't want to offer rides, which, which is fine, 
uh, but they must stop allowing tourists to feed a lot of high calorie treats. So there has to be a trade off between diet and exercise in order for elephants to be healthy. Uh, to further address criticisms that riding elephants is harmful, and a lot of people say elephants are not designed to carry uh, heavy weights. Uh, we worked with a specialist in the Department of Physical Therapy at Chiang Mai, uh, Dr. Serafan, who um, did a study of gait kinematics with us. So she looked at maximal angles of fore and hind limb joints using a three-dimensional inertial measurement system with wireless sensors. When the elephants walked a short distance, which was basically the length of a large field at Mesa Camp, with only a mahout riding on the neck, and then again with a saddle and two men, plus additional weights to make it 15% of the elephant's body weight, which actually is way more than what a normal riding elephant would probably have to carry. But what we found was that there were no significant effects of weight carriage on those gait parameters. And you can see in the thermal image, the only hot spot was where the saddle was. So this is just a preliminary study, and we need more data on elephants uh, walking for longer periods of time and over variable terrain. But these initial results um, suggest that elephants do appear capable of carrying significant amounts of weight without showing um, too many signs of physical distress. Uh, in terms of elephant control, the vast majority of camps use a hook working with elephants in free contact. Uh, which is a tool that, if used correctly, um, just ensures the safety of mahouts and elephants in cases of emergency. Uh, but hooks are often overused, and in this study, uh, wounds were found in 27% of elephants whose mahouts carried an ankles. And these wounds were associated with higher um, stress hormone concentrations. So controlling overuse of this tool is essential um, for better welfare. Only one camp had enclosures for elephants, so nearly all were all the elephants in these camps were chained when the mahu wasn't around and again at night, um, which sadly seems to be most of the time. Uh, the question now is how long is too long to keep an elephant chained? In this study, uh, about 88% of the camps chained the elephants for an average of 16 hours. And there was an association between chaining duration and expression of stereotypic behavior. But it was also associated with low, lower glucocorticoids, um, which indicates that these stereotypies might be serving as a coping or self-soothing mechanism. You know, animals uh, stereotype under conditions that are caused by boredom, frustration, anxiety, anticipation or fear. And so regardless of whether they are temporarily soothing, stereotypies indicate poor welfare and all efforts should be made to mitigate the conditions that cause them. So for example, don't chain elephants um, all day long. And um, it's better to allow them more free time to roam, forage and socially interact. Elephants are housed in a variety of ways, either together or separate, and they're um, very often chained. Interestingly, we saw the highest concentrations of glucocorticoids when elephants were kept together in sheds. We don't know exactly why this is, uh, but it could be related to elephants being chained in close proximity to unfamiliar or perceived antagonistic elephants or maybe not being able to reach bonded cohorts because the chains are too short. So we need to do more work on this to tease it apart and figure out, you know, really what is the best way to house elephants long term. So overall, a lot of the factors important to tourist elephant welfare are similar to those for elephants in the States. Uh, it's important for them to have free roaming or foraging time and a good balance between diet and exercise. Proper vet care is critical, as is limiting the overuse of tools, such as chains and the hook. Uh, the other three factors we haven't really studied in much detail yet, but these seem to be uh, maybe the next logical sets of studies to do. For example, if we could put some science behind the importance of using positive training techniques, that might go a long way to gaining acceptance. Uh, in the U.S., we found good keeper interactions lowered elephant cortisol levels, so it would be interesting to see if there might be similar effects with mahouts that have good relationships with their elephants. 
and the importance of social bonding and interactions. Um, it's so intuitive, but it would still be good to have some science to uh, make sure or to make that point and convince camps how really important it is for elephants to socialize, including for the bulls. And so all of these data, you know, have been published. Uh, the one thing I would say about working with Thai students that's really great is that <clears throat> they actually have to publish their work in order to graduate. <clears throat> so master's students publish one to two papers and PhD students publish anywhere from three to five. So this group has been really, really um, productive. So after doing all that work, the next step is to turn the science into action which the Chiang Mai vets are, are doing a really good job of. Um, they regularly visit camps and they've been informing them of the results and ways that they might um, improve their management. I was very happy to hear, for example, that some of the camps were having tourists feed fodder instead of bananas and sugar cane because of the study results on obesity. And to me, that was a major step in the right direction. So these grassroots efforts and working with the camp owners are, I think, really important and, and could potentially be paying off. And that's important because there are essentially no enforceable elephant welfare guidelines in Thailand. There are a couple of organizations that manage registration, uh, microchipping and also do annual health exams, but in terms of actual welfare guidelines and um, enforcing camps to do the right thing for elephants, um, that's non-existent. So um, as we were kind of wrapping up these welfare studies, a group of scientists, veterinarians, and managers decided that we should get together and create the uh, Asian Captive Elephant Working Group. Um, and it, it does consist of experts, not only in Thailand, but also a number of other Southeast Asian countries as well, um, again, focusing on tourist elephants. And our main goal was to create welfare guidelines to try to promote a high quality of life for, animal, for elephants that are used in the tourist industry and to um, create sustainable populations so that wild capture is no longer necessary. Um, but also that it's important that the elephants are not just used for entertainment, but that they can also serve as ambassadors to educate the public and contribute to, to conservation. So we worked with some travel companies to help them guide tourists to ethical camps sort of based on what our welfare guidelines were, <clears throat> which in our mind could include camps that allowed riding because we did not necessarily find that that in and of itself was bad for welfare. Um, the guidelines were then subsequently endorsed by the IUCN Asian Elephant Specialist Group, and then started to be used by the Asian Captive Elephant Standards, which is a company in Thailand that is using those guidelines or some of those guidelines to audit and um, certify camps, um, I guess not just in Thailand, but other Southeast Asian countries. And so we were making great strides with all this, and then boom, COVID hit. And in 2020 of April, Thailand um, banned all international travel and all tourism ceased and the camps closed. So we didn't exactly know what to do about this, but being scientists, we thought, well, we maybe better just study it. So we started to design a study to look at how the COVID-19 tourism ban was affecting camp management and then subsequently elephant welfare, um, kind of focusing on the Northern Thailand area. And we're in the perfect position to do this because we have had years and years of pre-COVID uh, data to compare it to. And so our graduate student is going to be um, working on uh, gathering data during COVID. Um, she was supposed to be looking at after COVID as well, but it's going on for so long. I have a feeling that her her um, PhD is only going to be during COVID and we'll have to find maybe somebody else to do the after COVID work. But anyway, our graduate student, I is her name, is going to be doing camp surveys of 30 camps with more than 400 elephants, um, surveying them every four months. So we're a little bit more than halfway through the study. And then there's a subset of seven elephant 
or seven camps with 60 elephants where we will collect samples to do the physiological and behavioral monitoring um, and then try to compare that to some pre-COVID data. So this table summarizes our survey data to date. Uh, when we did the first survey right after the shutdown, we also asked about conditions in the three months before COVID to use as baselines. So you can see the number of elephants decreased um, actually rather quickly after the camps closed and has sort of remained at that level. Um, whether Mahouts were taking the elephants out for other work or maybe taking them back to the village, we don't really know what happened to all of the all of these elephants. But the number of Mahouts has also decreased as they um, sort of left the field. Where before there was at least one Mahout per elephant. Um, in the last survey that we did um, recently, there was um, one Mahout per maybe two elephants. So the it's pretty clear that elephants aren't necessarily getting the daily care that they probably should have. And the reason for Mahouts leaving is not um, not not questioned um, in that they're getting a, a much reduced um, salary. So they're looking for other work and, and trying to find a way to make a living. Um, the work activities, the elephants before COVID were involved in riding shows, uh, tourist feeding, but of course now they have no activities and instead most of them are being chained pretty much all day long. Um, the chaining hours, to be perfectly honest, were pretty high <laughs> to begin with at like 16 hours. Um, but it's now even worse. And if you look at the last survey where the, the range is zero to 48 hours, I remember telling I, it's like, well, you can't have 48 hours in a day. And she said, well, it's because the camps are telling us that they're, that some of these elephants are chained for 48 straight hours before they get a break. So pretty dismal. There was only one camp that never chained its elephants. So that zero is, is, is for one camp. Walking distances are also decreased quite a bit if they're not giving rides, although I think the Mahouts are still trying to get them some exercise, although maybe not every day. Um, there's a little bit of an uptick in the amount of uh, distance per day in the last survey, and we think that it might be because the Chiang Mai group is telling the owners and the Mahouts how important exercise is, so maybe they're trying to do a little bit better job of, of getting the elephants some exercise, if not every day, then you know maybe every other day. They are still being bathed, but again, it's not necessarily always every day. The one uh, maybe positive thing coming out of this is that supplemental feeding of bananas and sugarcane are down considerably. So a lot of camps just aren't giving them these things at all, which um, I think is going to be really interesting to look in terms of metabolic function and that sort of stuff. And maybe that's not so much a bad thing. So the physiological assessments are basically the same as what we did in the studies before COVID hit. And, but then we also added some additional parameters, given that this is likely a once in a lifetime opportunities. So for example, we're looking at stereotypic behavior, especially given how long elephants are being chained now. Um, that study is being led by Dr. M. Uh, we also have decided to do white blood cell counts and to calculate the heterophil to lymphocyte ratio, which has been shown to correlate positively with cortisol and be another potential measure of stress and welfare. Um, and is something that Martin Seltman did uh, recently in Myanmar on elephants there. Uh, we're also interested in looking at oxidative stress and muscle function enzymes because these can be negatively affected by a lack of physical activity. So these are new tests for elephants. And while we don't have any data to show you yet, I think these are going to be really interesting to look at, um, especially once COVID is over and elephants hopefully start returning to normal uh, activities. So keep in mind, we're only partway through the two-year study. I'm going to show you some preliminary data that Dr. I recently put together for me. So for body condition, you can see that it's gradually declining over time <clears throat> during the pandemic. Uh, but before you get too excited, if you look at the scores that we're seeing, even at the very beginning, uh, keep in mind that a three is considered normal and five is very fat. So these are all very fat at the start of the study. And although they're lower now, um, they are still considered overweight a year or so out. 
And for some reason, this population started out even higher than what uh, Dr. Best uh, had done, where the mean was about three and a half. So maybe we're not making that much progress getting camps to reduce high calorie treats as we thought we were, but the decline could also be, um, it, it might be more dramatic if elephants were getting exercise at the same time, which of course they're not. So yeah, we're kind of interested in seeing um, how this goes over the next year. So looking at the lymphocyte to heterophyll ratio, knowing that the ratios go up um, as an indicator of stress, we do see a gradual increase. Uh, the uh, ranges or the, the data for these, um, these data are well within the range that Martin Seltman had reported in Myanmar. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if this trend continues over the next year. And although the data are quite variable, we're also seeing an upward trend to a little bit in serum cortisol, which agrees with the leukogram data. Uh, we don't have a lot of baseline serum cort in Thai elephants to compare it with, um, but in one study done a few years ago by uh, the technician Yim, uh, with only a few elephants, the concentrations are actually much lower than what we're seeing in these elephants today. Um, but because we don't have pre-COVID values on these elephants, um, I hesitate to overinterpret these data, but it suggests that stress levels might in fact be a bit up. But then when we look at fecal glucocorticoid metabolites, it doesn't really follow the other stress marker patterns, which is sort of frustratingly difficult to explain. Uh, the concentrations are in line with earlier studies, however, so it basically remains to be seen um, if they change at all during the COVID lockdown. And then Dr. M just recently published some preliminary data on stereotypies in camp elephants during COVID. Um, as you can see, the highest prevalence is in the adult age groups compared to younger or old, older elephants. Uh, she found 57% displayed stereotypies, which is similar to what was seen in a large welfare study in the UK a few years ago. In our big US welfare study, 84% of the elephants exhibited stereotypies, which sounds awful, although the vast majority stereotyped less than 15% of the day. In that study, elephants were recorded all day and night though, which likely accounts for the overall higher rates compared to the other studies where elephants were really only observed for short periods of time. I think M used uh, 15 minute observation periods for her study. But at 57%, this is a concern, um, especially uh, since stereotypes, uh, stereotypies are linked to chaining and can ultimately have negative effects on the feet and joints. And they can also become an ingrained, they can also become an ingrained behavior. So even when conditions improve, the elephants may still do it. So the final thing I'd like to present are some re results from a, um, a HOOT survey that we conducted to see how they are being impacted by the COVID shutdown. Uh, these data are from the first survey we did right after the camps closed, and then again a year later. And so as you can see, a high percentage of Mahoots are feeling stressed or sad um, with not much change over time. And they're also worried about reduced salaries and increasingly um, worried about being laid off, which has happened obviously to a number of them. Some Mahouts indicated they might sell their elephants or take them back to the village. The lower percentage after a year suggests that many may have actually done that. Uh, there was interest in planting grass to feed their elephants, although we don't actually know if any of this is happening. Um, in the last survey, about a third reported that they had taken out a loan to live on. This wasn't something that we saw in the first survey. And nearly everyone is appealing to outside organizations for help. And so a number of organizations have actually um, stepped up, uh, most notably the Thai elephant uh, Alliance Association and the Chiang Mai University Veterinary Group. Uh, the Department of Livestock apparently has provided some camps with grass or other fodder, um, but we're not sure if that's enough. I'm actually part of a fundraising effort to raise money for elephant veterinarians and to feed moms with babies. 
This is with Susan Makoda and the Elephant Care International with Hollis Burbank Hammerland and John Roberts, who is helping coordinate our work on the ground and is making sure funds get to where they are supposed to. Um, we don't uh, see this going away anytime soon, so we are continuing to seek donations. So if anyone is interested in helping, um, please, please do so. And you can certainly contact any of us for information how to do that. So I would like to end by sort of asking you all whether, whether we should maybe be looking at a paradigm shift in how we manage elephants and tourism. In the United States, as a result of the welfare work, a number of zoos actually got out of elephants because they realized they couldn't meet their welfare needs. But what about elephant camps? You know, perhaps it might not be a bad thing if there was some attrition in the number of camps with only those that are in more rural environments with forests or, um, you know, with forests for elephants to forage in or that have enough land to grow their own grass, you know, maybe those are the ones that could stay in business. You know, perhaps camps could partner more with local artisans. So even if tourists don't come, they can still sell products online and raise money for the elephants. Um, the idea of virtual tours, I think, is a good one. And although I know John doesn't charge for his, um, perhaps there are ways to monetize these so camps can stay in business during down times. I mean, I think this is an important question to ask because it's very likely that COVID won't be the last pandemic. So we need to be better prepared for the next one. And being kind of an internal optimist, I actually am sort of hopeful that we may see some positive change once this crisis is over. Um, and I am kind of looking forward to seeing what might happen next. So I'm going to leave you with that and just um, thank very much all of our sponsors and donors and foundations that have supported our work. Um, these studies can be very expensive and we certainly couldn't do it without a lot of help. And then finally, a big thank you to all my friends and colleagues in the US and in Thailand who have helped make this work possible, and especially to my Chiang Mai colleagues. You know, thank you for welcoming me into your world, teaching me about elephants, letting me be a mad scientist sometimes, and really just being the greatest colleagues I could ever hope to work with. Um, I have been truly blessed, and the only thing I wish for now is for COVID to be over so I can return to Thailand and Lao and Myanmar and to just get back to work. So I thank you all very much for, for listening, and um, I think we may have a few uh, minutes for questions. So, yeah, again, thank you so very much for your attention. Janine. Oh, there we I'm go. I'm still here. <laughs> You're still here. Very good. Um, well, thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, yeah, let me stop sharing a second. Thank you very, very much for that. Uh, when, when, when a self-professed eternal optimist and a rational scientist uh, tells you that um, this probably won't be the last pandemic, you, you know you've got cause for concern. <laughs> Um, I hate to leave, to leave it on a downer. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. That's, that's, that's it. Um, yep. Well, I see hands being raised all over the place. We do have, I think, the biggest number of people that we've ever had on in, in the Zoom. So um, a, anybody who has a question, please unmute yourself and uh, ask the question and then we'll get on to Facebook. Let's have, a, let's have a conversation. There's almost there's so much information there. I don't know what we're going to discuss next, but um, I see some people here who might have a question. So. Uh, um, please do unmute yourself and ask. Oh, I love the elephant bell. I don't know where that is. It's not mine. Oh my gosh, that brings me back home to Thailand. That's a yes. Okay, is that you, Josh? I, I can go first if you want. Is that your elephant bell? Yes, it's an elephant in my backyard, actually. That's what I thought. <laughs> Ch chained for 20 hours a day. I could remember, we're live, there's no time for jokes. Josh is joking. Hi, Josh. <laughs> Hi, Janine. Uh, excellent talk as always. Um, and I'm, I'm really fascinated by the recent results. My, my, I'm really interested by that body condition score of 3.5. Uh, I, and I really want to kind of hear, maybe dive into that just a little bit more. Um, you know, I, the only thing I can, I, I, I mean, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but how, how are these 
how are these camps continuing to potentially feed these elephants high calorie food? Are they still buying fruit to feed these elephants? And if so, then maybe the 3.5 makes sense. If they're not, and they're really only getting whatever they can get from grasses in the forests, then the only reason they might have a body condition score that high is that they're just not moving at all. Jeanine, would you agree with that? I mean, it's just, I think, such, I'm well, shocked. yes. I mean, I, yeah, actually, I think that's true. I don't think they're getting, well, I do think that there are some, I mean, I get the impression that there are some camps that are somehow getting, you know, deliveries of these kind of treats and that sort of thing. But I would have to think that the fact that so many of them are on chains much, much longer than they were before is a deciding factor. So it's going to take a while for body condition to go down anyway. And if they're not, um, so even if they're not getting the same amount of calories, but they're not exercising, I think it could take a while for it to come down to a, I mean, I really kind of hope one of the take home messages when we're all done with this and when we kind of go back into the camps is then, you know, they, they, there isn't that need to feed a lot of, of high calorie foods. And I realize it's a fun thing for tourists to do, but I think we could encourage tourists to do more feeding of their natural fodder and that sort of thing. And that would be just as much fun for the tourist and it would be better for the elephant. I'd just like to point out at this stage that we're not part of that study, um, um, so which because I think, unfortunately, <laughs> um, we would have. But I mean, my my other thing is I know there are a lot of elephants in the study, but um, it, it very much depends on which camps you go to. I haven't managed to travel around Thailand really, or northern Thailand, so it's a shame the vets aren't here, um, apart from Dr. Nisa, um, since April. But I have to say, when we went up to April in, to Mae Wang in April uh, to have a look around, the body condition was up the average body condition there was very low and i think if you bought in serene as well i've seen videos there uh mm -hmm. you would be seeing so i think it very much depends on which what has happened during covid we for instance have, have managed to still managing to feed too much to our elephants um despite all of our management efforts to try and bring that down and that sounds like a anyway those of you those of you who know us will know, know the problems and it could very well be that the camps that are allowing us to come back in and do these works i mean these are camps we've worked with in the past and so they're they're the ones that are probably doing pretty well and are still able to to yeah. you know get that kind of food but yeah i mean it that's a good point and it would be great to do like a national survey and you know to go into some of these places in other areas and see how those elephants are doing but yeah we're kind of limited by how much you can travel in the country well, I, right. that, that's this is possibly an offline uh, offline discussion, but let's talk to our hunger hurts elephants vets. I know the right. sorry, our elephant lifeline and welfare lifeline vet vets who were, were supporting through through yours and um, Susan and Hollis's scheme and say, well, in, in addition to everything else, can you just give us a quick BCS of every elephant you look at? Right. Um, and that might right. be something. Um, but yeah, very interesting that, that there, there, I mean, none of us had a plan for this, of course, uh, but some of us had more. Um, more in the bank and more more ability to to continue to feed elephants so very interesting to see that they they that yes they, as you say probably the camps that are i i would guess to answer josh's question that you're right janine that the camps that are letting you back in now to to do these things are the camps that had a vet to start with were interested in the science were actually act actively involved in in um in trying to improve welfare beforehand and therefore have also had a bit of a plan to to continue um, another hand up there as well. So next question, please. Kun Jin Tai. So I, my glasses are back. I can't. I can't. <laughs> <do this. laughs> ah, Tip. No, no, it's, it's not Doctor Tip. I, my glasses are very bad. It is. It is. It is Doctor Tip. It is. It is. Dr. Okay. Tip. Good. 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 <laughs> Hello. Tip, Tip will know the answer because she sees more elephants than any of us. Oh, there she is. Swadika. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the good uh, presenting many, many uh, good story. <laughs> and to, to more uh, information for uh, P. George question, I think is that related to the, the study that uh, we might choose the, the big camp to survey because I think the big camp has a better of the the financial support and they they can uh, get the loan from the bank and they have like the 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 place or the field for the food crop 
and uh, like like and they also have the good reputation for the donor so it might be uh, like they have a good plan to to get the food for their elephant even even in the crisis like this and also for the body condition score I, I think most of the elephant camp that I visited uh, many of them have the lower of body condition score of elephant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this the, the 33 camps that were part of this survey, they are a range of sizes. And, you know, some of them, a lot of them were the ones that we had looked at before. Um, a few of them were newer that I didn't recognize. Um, and I, you know, I actually, I actually gonna, I'm gonna go back to I and see whether in the past we've taken photographs so we could go back and reevaluate body conditions. So I'm gonna make sure that we're still getting photographs of all the elephants to sort of convince me that they're still carrying a lot of weight. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe we just happen to get into a group of camps around the Chiang Mai area that are doing better than the rest of the country. I mean, that is certainly possible. Yeah, and you're right, the bigger camps, they are better prepared and a lot of them do have their own vets and they've been sort of working with the Chiang Mai group for a really long time and they're more aware of of what needs to be done from a welfare standpoint. So yeah, expanding our horizons would probably not be a bad thing going forward. And uh, for, for more, if, uh, if there are some students that interested about the body condition score, I think right now many, uh, many uh, parameter is look maybe the same. Like uh, if I use the five score, I will. I would say that it uh, not the lower, uh, but if we look at the muscle, uh, like the muscle bundle, is atrophy mm -hmm. found in some of the uh, elephant. So uh, there might be like some special parameter or or some the new method to to monitor is that uh, uh, some of the muscle that that relate to to walking is atrophy or not, should be better. Right, so we, yeah, we are planning to look at muscle enzymes and some oxidative stress uh, factors that, you know, do, um, that, that, that do become abnormal when an, when an animal doesn't have any physical activity. And so we still have some of, for example, best samples from before. So we're hoping to look at these new tests that we haven't really looked at before. So some of them will be muscle function enzymes. And so you're absolutely right. I think that would be, that's gonna be, we haven't started that yet, but that's, that's gonna be fascinating to see if there are any differences because I would have to think that an animal that was used to riding and, and sort of being active and now is not, um, there could be some pretty significant changes. So yeah, very good point, Tip. Very good point. Yeah. That's why you're a good scientist too. <laughs> okay, any any other questions on from our Zoom participants? I just have one more really quick comment I think and it's on, just Josh. that the uh yeah sorry Josh here. The I mean I you know I I'm really it's really depressing to see the fact that before the pandemic these elephants were on chain 16 hours a day which I presume I hope was mostly overnight. Um, yeah. and then, but then to see 20 hours, you know, now, and, and, you know, I, I think that if anything, Janine, that data point is going to really, I hope trigger some sort of paradigm shift because that number is just awful. Um, and you know, I, I, the argument I would make is if you have enough money to employ someone to feed the elephant, you have enough money to, for that same person to let them off the chain a couple hours a day. So right. obviously more than that. So it's just sad, but I mean, I, I hope it, it triggers some change. You know, I couldn't agree more. And to be honest, I sent, I sent, I sent the students back to say, are you sure that this like pre-COVID 16 hours, are you sure that's right? Because I that just blew my mind, you know, that it was that high to begin with. But um, but yeah, during COVID, you know, when I told me that her zero to 48 actually meant that some elephants were chained for 48 straight hours, I mean, my heart sunk. So I I hope you're right. I mean, I hope when we get out of this and we have all these new data points and that sort of thing that, and the, the tourist authority of Thailand is listening to us, 
you know, I hope we can move the needle in some way because, um, yeah, a lot of these practices are kind of indefensible in a way. But yeah, but I mean, but most of the, you know, for sure, the chaining is mostly at night. I mean, the, you know, when everybody kind of leaves the area late afternoon, late afternoon, early evening, that's when they put animals on chains and then they're not released again until, you know, after daylight kind of thing. But yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's, we've long been saying that there should be some guidelines about who, where, where you can have elephant camps and who can have, it, it, there needs to be some, as you pointed out halfway through, that, that there, there are no guidelines as to where a business, how an elephant business should be run. And, um, and, and that needs to, that needs to change. I mean, it's, it's and hopefully COVID will, will point to that as well. And increased chaining is a, as you say, 16 hours is far too much to start with. And then, then the fact that a lot of, a, a lot of, you, you said in the thing that a lot of mahouts have gone because they are seeking higher salaries. But I think it's also unfortunately the case that a lot of the, the camp owners who, who in the good times had bought elephants weren't, weren't prepared for this and aren't, and, and aren't aware of elephant welfare and they've just let people go rather than so they've they've had as, as if you look at any other business throughout covid they have they've looked at it in a tourism business and they said okay we can't afford half your staff so we'll decide which half we keep and you'll be on reduced wages and i'm sure that is what has happened and um the whole thing um also should point out as in with i've been talking about uh, conservation as well over the last week or so to people that that we can't rely on well again <laughs> we're not going to get into the number of elephants we have in captivity but we can't rely using using tourism as a way to keep this the only method to keep elephants in in captivity is not uh, certainly this number of elephants is not a good idea but anyway before i get on to my own hobby horses shall we if we have no other questions from um from zoom i think dr tip's hand is still up from she hasn't just hasn't taken her hand down yet dr niso i see we have lots of questions coming through on the uh coming through on the on zoom uh, sorry on facebook so could you unmute and ask some of them i don't think we have time for them all though yes hello janine so let's see so the first question i saw is can cortisol present differently in feces versus blood how could that be explained <laughs> yeah well i wish i had all the answers to that um we we have several examples of where feces and core and serum don't necessarily correlate. And I think it could possibly be due to the difference in, you know, serum cortisol being more of a real time kind of an acute measure where uh, fecal court is uh, sort of an accumulated um, measure over about a three day period. It kind of has to do with the gut transfer time. So, um, you know, there are a lot of other studies that have shown kind of the same thing. So we're still, you know, as, as many years as we've been looking at this, it's still kind of in the early stages of trying to figure out which one might actually be the best measure for, um, as a proxy for stress. Um, but I'm kind of talking around in a circle, but I, I you know, I was, I was kind of surprised that the fecal cortisol did not track the serum as, as, you know, better than it did. So I'm kind of waiting to see what the rest of the study is going to look like. In, in other studies, though, it, it did correlate very well with some of our other welfare measures. So I'm, I, you know, I think fecal cord is a good measure to use, but it's more, more of, a, of an indicator of chronic stress as opposed to what's happening in real time acutely. So I think that's probably the difference. Without knowing much about either, um, it could it be possibly that all the elephants recognize the vet when she walks in and know they're about to get a jab in the ear. <laughs> and so that it's not a question even, I mean, my, my stress presumably rises when, when somebody jabs me with a needle, but even <laughs> the, the elephants know, even they, they, I mean, my cat knows Nisa now, unfortunately, right. even, the cat, even the cat she's not having to inject when the car turns up, both my cats disappear, including the one she's not currently helping me with. Um, could it be something to do with that? And it certainly, yeah, it certainly could. And, you know, we've sort of wondered about, um, even with our big welfare study, we sort of wondered whether maybe the serum cortisol is a better indicator of like a stress reactivity um, thing so that those elephants that, you know, maintain fairly lower levels of cord are, you know, more used to being handled and they have, you know, more relaxed temperaments and that sort of thing. So we're still, yeah, they were still trying to tease all of that apart. So yeah, that could certainly be the case. I, I think it takes about 
there have been a few studies and it probably takes 10 to 15 minutes or so for the blood court to really register. So, I mean, unless you're really slow at getting the blood sample, you know, that's when it comes into play, but yeah. And so we're not actually doing like timing of when we approach the elephant and how long it takes to take the sample, which might be another piece of information to record, yeah. Well, yeah. without going down this rabbit hole and moving quick swiftly onto the next question, when, when say the Thai Elephant Conservation Center come to take blood samples here, um, the elephants are lining up watching one another get, so the first one may not be stressed, but the, <laughs> yeah. the one at the back has, has watched several um, and, and doesn't, doesn't shy away or worry about it, but that, that gives you time. Anyway, enough, enough of that, because um, there's, there's so much information and so many questions. Um, Nisa. Yes. So another one is what do um, what was it? The question was about the word fodder that you use. So aside from the high sugar bananas and sugarcane, I guess. So what else would you consider to be a fodder for the elephants? Well, th those are just the grasses that they like um, napier grass or um, banana grass, you know, banana stems, that sort of thing. So it's, it's the, it's not the fruit, it's the actual plant itself is what I mean by fodder. Right. Okay. <laughs> and there are, let's see, hold on. Do I see any more? Mm -hmm. Hold on. Righty. <laughs> well, if anyone have anything to talk about, go ahead. I'm, I'm going. I'm sifting through. Hold on. I'll work up for that. I, I mean, Jesse. Jesse makes a question. Has a question as well, which is which is which is important. I think. Um, he says uh, he knows that chains are unpopular, but wonders if it would be interesting to add, or is there any study done on the length of chain and the environment an elephant is chained in, uh, in order to, to, to work out what is, it, 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 as part of the study, is it possible to do that? Because presumably, um, well, hopefully an elephant that is, that is chained on a long chain in the forest, uh, even for 48 hours is is in a better mm -hmm. condition. Well, it's definitely in a better condition, in my opinion, than an elephant that's on a short chain right. on a concrete floor for 48 hours. Um, and the other, another question I saw coming through was, uh, which you may just want to answer is, why do the elephants have to be chained at night anyway? Um, um, and what I guess, what are the other options, which I, I can answer, but I think we'll leave it to you to answer. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that that's the thing. I mean, they, they would, they would wander off where in places you don't want them to go. So, you know, most of these camps, they don't, they're not enclosed. They don't have big fences. They don't have a way to keep the elephants contained necessarily. And, and most, there are a few camps now that are building uh, corrals and um, enclosures and that sort of thing, but that's not a, a real popular thing to do right now. So basically it's to keep the elephants, you know, in one place so they don't wander off and cause cause trouble. Um, you know, I think that the question about chain length and that sort of thing, that's, that's going to be really important. We do have data on the chain length for this study, but it, you know, it has a tendency not to vary a whole lot. So, but I think that's an excellent question. And I think that's something that is, would, would well deserve, you know, even designing a study where you put elephants on different chain lengths and, and take a look at how that affects their behavior and, and some of their physiological measures and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just go on and sorry, I, I said I'd let you answer. It, basically, you're, to stop, it, all elephants in captivity are, are kept into an area at some point or another, which is one of the arguments pro and anti-captivity possibly, uh, but they have to be wild elephants, obviously will roam into, into farmers' fields and cause trouble. And we've, got, we've done a lot of lectures on human elephant conflict. Um, and mm -hmm. part of the responsibility of managing elephants in captivity is making sure they're not getting shot at by farmers. Um, question, but I went, when we, we work very hard when we're writing guidelines, um, Janine and I and everybody else involved in the guideline research to, to not focus on whether an elephant is enclosed by a fence or by a chain because it doesn't seem to make that much difference to the elephant but the amount of space right. available to that elephant and its access to 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 its friends at the time um, and uh, that I think hopefully answers most of the questions that have come through as to as to why um, and yes why why we don't necessarily focus when we're writing guidelines on whether an elephant is chain or chained or enclosed but the amount of space natural habitat and um, and 
friends it's a it's, that are available to the things that, that we seem to look for and study to see and as you say many many more studies to be done um nisa any more questions Well, and I think too, whether the chaining is keeping elephants isolated. I mean, I think that's another thing that we're very concerned about. You know, it's, it's um, you know, it's just, they're a social species. And so, you know, using chains to keep elephants socially isolated is really not, not good. And I think, um, you know, in places like Myanmar where they would let them out at night, but they were on these huge, like 20 meter drag chains or something like that. So being chained was not such a deterrent, you know, or, or a, you know, a bad thing for them. So I think, you know, the problem is most of these camps, you know, they don't have that kind of land that they can let, you know, all their elephants out on 20 meter chains and that sort of stuff. So that's kind of why I was, you know, I don't, I don't know whether it'll happen or not, but the, you know, a, some attrition in camps that are very maybe urban and really don't have any space for elephants to go other than just being on fairly short chains you know, maybe it would be kind of nice maybe to see some of those. I mean, in the United States, after our big welfare study, like I said, you know, a lot of zoos got out of, got out of elephants because they realized they couldn't do what they needed to do. I don't know if that will happen with the camps, but that would be, in my, in my view, that would be a positive outcome from some of this stuff. Yeah, agreed. I think it's uh, <laughs> um, not wanting to, not wanting to, 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 this, the competition or anything like that but yes if you can't give the elephants the space they need and the social interaction they need then perhaps we should and it all comes back to we need we do need some sort of guidelines and licensing and it has to be government enforced i think um and and again we as a group are helping to to push things in that right direction but it needs to come from the government to say you cannot have an elephant camp if you cannot give the elephants the space they need um and then then you can have other guidelines added on top of that with some 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 very basic things like this um anyway that hopefully that will come out of the uh, come out of the pandemic um nisa hasn't oh she has unmuted herself nisa yep so another one was do you see a difference in stress level in chain and non-chain conditions and what are some of your insights on that well, we did in our early um, earlier studies uh, before COVID that there was an association between um, chaining and glucocorticoids. So um, yeah, I mean, it does appear to, to have a relationship. You know, the interesting part though was the stereotypies being associated with lower glucocorticoids. So that again, you know, it sort of complicates the question because if an elephant is chained and they're gonna have higher glucocorticoids, but if it's an elephant that's stereotyping, you know, that sort of reduces their stress levels. So it, it's, it, it's, not a simple, it's not a simple question or a simple answer, uh, but we do see, but we, do, we did see some relationships with chaining and glucocorticoids. Yeah, I mean, for me, in a perfect world, you know, the elephant would only be chained when there was no other, you know, it, they needed to be put to bed <laughs> and, and they don't want them wandering off in, into neighbors' fields. But during the day, you know, as long as people are around, their mahouts are around, you know, ideally they would, they would be off chain. And we're pushing for that. That's what we're pushing for. And the, the mahout, hey? yes, and breaking away from this habit of, an ele of the mahouts popping an elephant on chain and going off and doing other things um their, their job again it, it, it's incredibly yeah. difficult to enforce as i know as a manager their job is to look after the elephant so a management technique where they because it also key I, I know in the first study or the first the first one of the first studies you did the elephants that were observed only observed and we didn't have any mahout interference at all also seemed to have higher uh glucocortisol um which you put down to obesity but may also have been something to do with being forced into different social groups and everything else the, the truth is again there's so much work for you to do here to try and work out exactly what's going on you need to go down almost on an elephant per elephant level uh, and yeah well what we really need to do though is to you know if we could get some camps to work with us and actually set up experiments you know we, where we could set up elephants in different kinds of conditions and then you know sort of control the situation but we're kind of dealing with a situation where we're we're kind of working with the camps, you know, in good faith and, you know, trying to tease apart all the different things that they're doing. So we're, we're, we're sort of at a helicopter view right now and, and it would be, we're trying to kind of whittle down into more specific questions, yeah. 
you know, don't want to get it. And yes, I mean, uh, yeah, we could go on. we could go on forever. I'm not going to put any of my elephants on a short chain for 48 hours for you, I'm afraid. No, <laughs> that's true. Uh, but, then, but then you think a, a lot of the elephant, I mean, this is, the, oh, we, we could go on forever. I, I'm going to try and stop there. I was going to say a lot of the reason maybe some elephants are, are on that because they are already stressful and difficult to work. Uh, yes, yeah, there's so much going on. Um, well, actually, there was a study. Oh, my gosh. I'm Well, maybe it was part of the welfare study. There was a study where, no, it was it was earlier on, where elephants that were chained and kept separate at night, actually, those some of those elephants had lower cortisol that they felt was due to the fact that they were they felt safe and secure because if they were chained then other elephants couldn't sort of beat up on them kind of thing so that was i forget what study that was but that was quite a few years ago but that was an interesting thing that for some elephants that was a security that they had so being chained meant that they weren't going to be you know approached by other elephants that they didn't want to so i mean it's so here's the other here's the other thing you know elephants are these you know very intelligent um they have different temperaments. They're like people, you know, some like to be by themselves and some like to be very social. And so we're trying to layer on all of these questions, but, you know, keeping in mind, you know, some people, some people are highly stressed and, and, and some people are very laid back and elephants are kind of the same way. So you can't, it's not a one size fits all solution for something as complex as an elephant. So that's the other kind of layer. So it's not just so this is the part, the hard part with coming up with guidelines, you know, it's not like we can have like, like a one size fits all that some elephants are going to need to be handled differently than other elephants. And how do we nuance those individual personality differences and that sort of thing. So that makes it even that much more complicated. Yep. But we're, we're still trying. Exactly. <laughs> we're still trying. We're still trying. And um, uh, unless Nisa has any other questions, um, I, I think I'll probably wrap it up. And we're still trying. And, but we are, as an elephant manager and somebody who has somehow taken on the role of trying to help other elephant managers as well, I can say we have a much clearer picture of, of what is needed and what is actually good for elephants and what is what is not good for elephants, thanks to your work and the work of the Chiang Mai the Chiang Mai group and the, the people who've uh, who've opened opened our eyes for us, if you if you see what I mean, and, and given us pointers in the right direction as to what we should be doing. So um, um, I think I'm going to wrap it up there and say thank you very much. Um, uh, those of you who are watching who are not don't know Janine, Janine and I and Josh and Nisa and Dr. Tip, um, we do have these long conversations going on for and and it is something that we we could go on just chatting for hours around and around in circles Forever. indeed have and will do in the future but we won't we won't continue to, to bore you with it out in the outside world um, an amazingly complex situation but we're, we're so so grateful that Janine you and your team and the people you've mentored down the years are shining a uh, a light on things that help us help us move in the right direction and not only in our own area managing elephants but also in the in the wider population as well so uh, i think i'm going to say thank you very much do you have any last words yeah. <laughs> final a uh, final statement not a last word of course no not really <laughs> i could talk elephants but i don't want to talk me so yeah i appreciate the opportunity and again you know it takes a village so it's not just it's not just me it's everybody that is willing to kind of work together. So I really appreciate that. And what a great seminar series, John. You should be applauded for doing this. That's amazing. Well, thank Sorry, you. it took me so long to do one. <laughs> no, no, thank you for thank you for coming along. We do have we do have um what every Wednesday this week, this month we have one. I think next Wednesday we'll be talking to Sean Hensman, who's an elephant manager for Adventures with Elephants in South Africa. Um I, my the the lockdown live stream will be back at four o'clock this afternoon and i think four o'clock tomorrow afternoon as well for those of you who want to join us on facebook uh, we don't get too scientific we just point cameras at elephants as they wander around and eat things and um and i tend to ramble so for those of you who haven't seen that before please do join us um and for everybody else who has seen it who does join who do join us all the time thank you very much but particularly thank you to janine again not only for for the work you do but also for, for coming to join us all right thank you very much Kap -kun -ka.